This video is a short series. You may wish to look at the previous two recordings associated to the introduction of risk assessment and the five steps before you watch this one. So I'm just going to walk through a couple of examples here just to show you what a risk assessment would look like. As I've said before, there are multitude of methodologies in this and this is just a couple of examples. The first one is a working at height and we've just taken some small areas associated to that. So in the case of this risk assessment, we've looked at working at height, we've documented the risk assessment, we've recognised that it's an additional revision that we're working on here, who the assessment was taken by, so it's the people undertaking the task, and who it was approved by. We've got a date and then we've got a future review in place in case there are not any other subsequent changes. We're looking at the task activity, who or what is at risk, the hazard, i.e. what could actually harm, the rating associated to that in terms of the severity and the likelihood multiplied to give us the risk rating, any control measures that we have or are putting in place, and then again, another risk rating based on the residual effect of those controls. So the new severity, the new likelihood multiplied to give us the risk. And it's often common practice to use a color code methodology, align to your risk matrix, just to give you that quick guidance review. People can refer to colors in a much quicker way. So we've looked at and identified that a fall from height is a serious occurrence, and we've identified a number of control measures which we have put in place that people must follow in order to bring that risk level down. It is important to point out at this point in time that often the severity related to a hazard often does not reduce. So if someone falls from height, if the severity rating is a five and very high, therefore there's a potential for, for fatality or serious injury, the possibility is that our control measures we put in place reduce the likelihood of that happening. But there's a strong possibility that the severity, if it does happen, will still occur. And the severity may still be at the same rating. There are some risk assessments we would do that the potential severity would go down because of the practices that we have in place. Um, but it is important to recognise that in not all cases does the severity reduce. So we've added another couple of sections here around uh, using mobile elevated work platforms, where again we're referring to who or what is at risk, and we're saying here that this could be the worker, an asset, or the potential of just other people walking by. Again, there could be issues associated to someone falling if not properly controlled in place. But there can also be the situation of dropped objects where the people at harm could be underneath the work at height. So we've identified a number of controls in place associated to this, particularly around the equipment because it's the use of a mobile elevated work platform. So there's training required and competence to assess these individuals using it. There's ensuring that the equipment itself is serviced and maintained and certified. And it's important to ensure that pre-use checks are undertaken. And lastly, it's important to recognise that there are other PPE type requirements when working on the mobile elevated work platform, as well as the control of any tools or additional items we take with us. We could go on and on on this and show other additional information about working at height, including the use of ladders. The simple methodology here is looking at what is the task or activity or the item being used, who or what is at risk, what is the hazard itself, and doing a risk rating in terms of the severity and the likelihood multiplied to give us the risk, this is the risk that associated to if no additional controls or no controls are in place. Then we identify what controls we have, possibly adding more 
to it if needed. And then the necessary risk assessment again, showing the residual level. It is possible that if we do not get it low enough, we have to step back, maybe take guidance and advice from others to see what other additional control measures need to be put in place. So another quick example here, using a slightly different methodology, but very similar, is looking at a workshop, various activities. So it could simply just be moving around the workshop. It could be the housekeeping inside a workshop. It could be also concerns associated to lighting or temperature or third parties coming into the workshop. So we again, we look at who and what could be at risk. We look at what the hazards are and what effectively could happen. So we can refer to slips and trips. We can refer to uh, bringing third parties on that could potentially harm others, including themselves, could damage assets or the environment. And then we look at doing the risk rating again, it's the severity. So if it actually happens, how bad will it be? The likelihood is the likelihood of it occurring and we're multiplying that together to give us our risk rating. So this is using our matrix. And the one we described before was the five by five matrix. So we can see uh, taking each, each axis and coming to a predefined calculated point and giving us the risk rating. Beyond that, we've got our control measures. So those control measures may not always simply be the controls we have in place at the task in hand. They can be controls that are contributing factors which occur earlier on in a process. And if we take the control of third party contractors demonstrated here, this is a prime example of that. We have what we're saying are processes and procedures in place associated to the management of our suppliers. So first of all, we want to ensure we understand the task they're going to be doing. We understand um, and get confidence that they are an appropriate supplier or third party contractor to do that task. We may look for evidence to support that. We may ask for references. We may go to a job that they've done and assess it or just simply do an audit on them. We may ask for additional information from them. Could be competence assessment records associated to their employees or it could also be their risk assessments that they bring to our workplace. It's also important that these are done dynamically because we must recognize that there can be multiple activities happening at our workplace and the risk assessment provided by the third party contractor may be around their activity in isolation and not understanding how it works when we have multiple operations happening at the same time. So it is important to recognize that often it can be the task in hand, but there can be contributing factors that come from the methodology we use through our processes and procedures within our systems. I just want to say thanks very much and repeat again, if you would like to subscribe to our YouTube channel and also please go to our free resources section on our website where you can pick up risk assessment templates, risk assessment processes and procedures and other supporting information there.